I'd like to uh, welcome you all to Startup Grind. Startup Grind is uh, conducted in partnership with the Google for Entrepreneurs. Uh, the conductor is a public-private partnership with, between the University of Central Arkansas and Startup Junkie. And uh, we are here focused on trying to catalyze an entrepreneurial ecosystem in Central Arkansas. Uh, we spend a lot of time focused on innovation, entrepreneurship, a lot of time focused on talent development at all ages, uh, from K-12 all the way up through college and beyond as well as focused on economic empowerment. Uh, economic empowerment being uh, creating a dollar where one didn't exist is the way we like to talk about it. So we're glad that you're here. Uh, we're glad that you've been engaged with the conductor in the past. For those of you that haven't, uh, we hope to see you around at our conductor events again. Uh, I'd like to introduce the conductor team, Kim Lane, CEO. Not waving everybody. Right. Hi, Kim. Uh, we've got Dylan and Kaylin in the back there. Do we have other members or is Glenn Crockett? Glenn's right here as well, there's Glenn. Uh, Glenn's our 10X uh, Accelerator Director, 10X Growth Accelerator Director. We've got some alumni from the 10X Accelerator I see sitting here. And uh, How many of you have been engaged directly with the conductor from some type of entrepreneurial support? Very, very good. Very, very good. Glad to see that. Uh, so what we're going to do, if those that haven't been to Startup Grand, we'll take about, I don't know, four or five hours. <laughs> you you got to go. <laughs> Take about 40 to 45 minutes, and we'll be engaged in a bit of a dialogue. I've got a few questions for Charles, and I'm sure he will um, keep me honest on many of those questions. And then I would encourage you during that time to make note of any questions that you have, uh, because at the end we'll get the opportunity for you to ask those questions, and it'll be a candy camera kind of session. That's all right. Whatever. Yeah, I'm good with all, all right. that. <clears throat> uh, we would ask that you are active on social media, as always. Uh, uh, at AR Conductor is our Facebook handle. At uh, AR underscore conductor is our Twitter handle using the hashtag full steam uh, AR and we encourage you to take photos uh, to live tweet or live Facebook if you need maybe interesting comments that you hear uh, from Charles and uh, we would appreciate that if you would. So be sure to write down your questions because we're going to give you the opportunity to ask those shortly. You ready? Take a deep breath. Got it. So I, I have the distinct pleasure of interviewing Charles, um, Charles Morgan. Most of you know Charles. Uh, if you don't, uh, then you're in for a real treat tonight. Uh, I had the distinct pleasure of working for slash with Charles for a number of years and uh, lots of great stories. Uh, if you have not read his first book, Matters of Life and Data, uh, a, memoir, a memoir, The Remarkable Journey of, big data, of a Big Data Visionary Whose Work Impacted Millions, including you, even if you didn't ever work at Axiom, uh, the work of Axiom and of Charles in, uh, impacted you as well. I would encourage you to do that. It is a fascinating story of Charles's uh, life leading up to Axiom and then the lives of a number of people throughout the Axiom career's uh, trajectory as well, rather. So I would encourage you to do that. We're gonna talk a little bit tonight as well about your new book, Now What? Uh, the biography of a finally successful startup. So we'll be talking a little bit about that. Those of you who've had a startup, you know, you think you're going to make it, you think you're going to make it, and finally you think you've made it, and you did. <laughs> and you look back, when, when did that happen? Yeah, I know. So Charles, um, some of us probably in the room have read Matters of Life and Data, and, and it, I know it tells your story from starting in Fort Smith, growing up right. in Fort Smith, and what have you. But if you don't mind, take just a moment and give us the short version, short as you can or as you want to, about growing up, your life, education, and career trajectory summarized in a, maybe leading up to Axiom, and then we'll go from there. I was just a, a you know, poor, shy high school kid who was a geek. Everybody, my mother was so worried about me that she insisted that I go to a liberal arts school because she said, all you want to do is play with motors and, you know, and, and build boats, and I, you know, you don't are not that interested in dating girls, and but you so you need to go to a liberal arts school. So I went to the University of South Sewanee, and then but I always knew I wanted to be an engineer, and I, you know, went from uh, Sewanee to the University of Arkansas, and got a degree in mechanical engineering, uh, and then went to the greatest training ground on the earth. In those days, it was IBM and spent five and a half years with IBM. And at that time, I had to make a decision that I want to be a career corporate guy or be an entrepreneur. And my father had been an entrepreneur uh, and it you know, kind of ran in my blood. His father had been an entrepreneur. 
And in the end, I, to IBM's great distress, they had just offered me an incredible promotion and I quit. And they were shocked and dismayed. And I went to this company that, uh, as the time, the IBM guy said, you realize they can't pay their bills, we're about to take their computers out. And that was what is now Axiom. <laughs> wow. So, so uh, my next question. Is that is, thumbnail enough? Is that, that, like that, was, that was thumbnail. <laughs> so my next question normally would be, what That's were my you, elevator suite. Yeah, speech. what were you thinking? But uh, tell us a little bit about what- That's what you, they said. <laughs> exactly. They did. They really so, did. so, what led you there, and what made you decide to take that particular leap? Well, I, you know, it was kind of interesting. I had this. I knew I could get a job outside of Arkansas, but I had this strange attraction to Arkansas, and why I don't know. But one of my accounts had been Walmart, and Sam Walton in the very early days made a huge impression on me. And even though I got to see a lot of other companies and in these I, young, I hear my young 25 year old IBMer and I'm, I'm actually talking to Sam Walt, literally talking to Sam Walt, presenting to Sam Walt at age 26 or something. Uh, and Tyson's the same. Some of these now are great companies. And I got to see companies that were successful and not so successful. But I also saw an Arkansas workforce that could do amazing things. I, I can't explain it to this day why I decided when I knew a lot of my friends had gone to TI or EDS or some of these other Texas companies, and some had gone further than that. And I wanted to stay in Arkansas, and I wanted to be a, an entrepreneur in the computer business. And by the way, in those days, what we became is kind of a service bureau business. Right. And I, uh, that was not, that was kind of like being a street sweeper or something. It was not really all that honorable. And uh, everybody looked down on certain, because you owned your own computers or you weren't worth, you know, doing the work for them. So, but uh, it's, it's amazing. That's what I wanted to do. And I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And when I came to work, I told uh, that uh, the business had been started by Charles Ward of the bus company. And my friend Alex Dietz, who was the one who I'd be working with, is co-running this business. I said to Alex and to Charles, I said, I want to tell you all something. I'm going to do everything I can to help build this into a $10 million a year revenue business, even if it takes a lifetime. <laughs> so we, we did end up at one point four billion. this way, ten million dollars. <laughs> it was like, and that was the size of my uncle's hardware store. I thought that was the biggest business I could ever hear imagine mm -hmm. in Arkansas, other than Walmart. So, but yeah. Walmart, by the way, had seven <clears throat> stores when I was calling on Sam. Seven stores. Seven, yeah, oh. seven. But I recognized the brilliance of Sam Walton. And I, I just said he is, he's an amazing guy and his strategy uh, is incredible. And by the way, they offered me uh, what now would be about $30 million worth of Walmart stock at the IPO. Of course, I'd have sold it as soon as it was worth 10000 or 20000 <laughs> That matter. Yeah. Gotcha. So talk a little bit about, you, you mentioned that Axiom uh, CCX or, or demographics actually yeah. when you when you started there um, was really more in the service bureau business running computers and, and what happened. And working for political parties and candidates and uh, at the time that I started we actually still had a computer in Washington DC which we were trying to get out of. We had an office up there which we were getting out of uh, but our biggest customer was uh, well, was you know the the bar, you know the bus company, mm -hmm. but Conway Corp was our second biggest customer. I think shortly Good. after our billing and yeah, did billing and all okay. that kind of stuff. And you know we were running general ledgers for fifteen dollars a piece. And that was exciting business. But uh, soon after I got there, uh, I, it was clear to me that. Uh, we had to build a national business. And if we were going to be 10 million, you couldn't do that with this business. It was going to be too hard. So we were doing business with Democratic 
politician party organizations, but I'm not very political. And, uh, you know, today in time, it's kind of hard not to be. It's kind of like, oh my God, that's all the world's all about is, you know, is politics, but it gets a little tiring. I think in those days, nobody cared much about them, and now it's too much in the news. What about happy mediums? Is that, you know, can we kind of get in the middle? I don't know. Bam. Uh, I knew we had to build something that we had a sustainable advantage in, and I could see that direct marketing was something very interesting because it dealt with a lot of data, databases, lists, and a related technology. And, you know, it wasn't soon that I realized that the uh, direct marketing industry was very unsophisticated. So, so let's, let's dig a well there a moment. So you, you began to see the direct marketing industry very involved in data. You're in an organization as CEO running computers. Yeah. What caused you to seek this thing called data, ultimately big data, and, and what? how did you make that? Well, you know, you know uh, Jeff, these things always uh, evolve over time. And uh, when we were uh, working with the Democratic Party, uh, very closely affiliated with the Democratic Party is the AFL-CIO. And the AFL-CIO had some big ideas about doing uh, national get out the vote polling work and others with their members. But a lot of their, their membership roles were so bad, they did. They often had only an address for these, they didn't even have phone numbers for them. And so they wanted to match their membership with voter rolls and with phone books to get phone numbers for them and you know, previous voting history. And, and this was 19... Uh, this was 1973, okay. so it was really early, and, and I don't know if you, know, you all followed this, but AFL-CIO and the Democrats, up until very recently, were miles ahead of the Republican Party using data to drive, get out the vote, polling, and you know, focus efforts for uh, ultimately not just the, their membership, but others in the community. Uh, so <clears throat> we had a chance to help them with that project, and you know, because of, in those days they were trying to match against national phone books, uh, phone rolls, and national voter registration. It was a big. It was kind of the first big data project, if you will. And I I realized that it took sort of all the skill we had to try to sort through how to do this. And the tools we were working with were literally like, you know, I was trying to knock down a, a, a mountain with a handheld axe, but we actually were successful. And uh, ultimately, we decided we didn't want to necessarily get that involved with AFL-CIO for a lot of reasons, because they didn't want to do a lot of stuff off-site. So we had to, you know, do a lot of it in Washington. But we finally sold the software to them. But it taught me at that time that you gotta have your eyes open for opportunity. Isn't you may think you're gonna go here, but you may see an opportunity in that direction, but it's kinda of over here. And uh, at that time, we began to redirect ourselves more, getting away from computer letters and the actual marketing you know, side of it, which we'd actually, we were actually doing kind of a full service a direct mail uh, agency at that time. And we kind of moved away from that and uh, still doing our service bureau work. And uh, around that time, we made a commitment as an organization. We're gonna get completely out of the service bureau business and make it or not make it in this thing called, the, what I'll call the list industry and marketing database and so, we had limited resource, and that's one thing entrepreneurs always have, is very limited resource. And we said, if we're gonna be successful, we can't do but maybe one thing well, and we'll be lucky if we could afford to do that. So as fast as we can get, generate revenue in this space and, and use our service bureau revenue to help support that as we transition. But it was this idea of creating focus. 
and focus on something we felt like was being very done, very poorly done by other people in the world. And ultimately, as you know, we built a thing called, you have the loft system. Has anybody in here ever heard of the loft system? There's some old let's, people. Let's, These let's, are old people. Let's, let's see if we can, who, who knows the acronym besides the people in the back? Glenn's List Order Fulfillment, list order fulfillment yeah. System. So we were very sophisticated marketeers, weren't we, Glenn? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the List Order Fulfillment System was a technology leap well beyond anything the industry had ever seen. As a matter of fact, the rest of the people that we competed against in those days, and were mostly in Northeast Bay, literally laughed at us. Said, what are you Arkansas hillbillies? I'm not even exaggerating. What do you hillbillies think you're gonna do? Build sophisticated computer online technology? And they literally made fun of us in the market. Of course, we drove all of them out of business. And when I left in 2016, it was still in use. It was. That's degree. amazing. Yeah, it still, I think it was phased out in, in, yeah. in, in 16 or, yeah. yeah. It so, was phased out in 16. So, anyway, it's, you know, one of the lessons there is got to get focused. you got to figure out something that will scale and it has a market big enough. You know, if it doesn't have a big market, I said the service bureau business, we never, do, it's not a big market, and particularly in Arkansas base. You're never going to get very wealthy doing that or build a very big business. And the list, or the direct mail industry was really growing, really taking off at that time. We had no idea how it was going to take off. And if we have time, we can talk about the whole telecom industry because we're in the same spot. You know, I'd rather be lucky than good. I don't know about any of the rest of you guys, but I, I would. And we've been lucky to pick, or I've been lucky to pick two industries that were just taken off. Well, I want to get into that second industry in just a moment. I'm going to take mm -hmm. a phrase from your from your second book here in a moment. If people don't understand it, then you can buy the book and read it and, and see what it means. But uh, when you started at Axiom, uh, 25 employees, 800,000-ish in revenue. You Correct. left with 7,000 employees, a billion. That's your right after your sham retirement party. That's the phrase I was going to take from the book. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, a billion and a half in revenue. Right. So if you could, maybe outline for us three watershed moments during that period. Well, uh, one of them has to be the development of the List Art Fulfillment System. Okay. Because uh, that gave us a foothold. We had repeatable revenue, something that we you know, gained a reputation with, and it could generate enough revenue to support a lot of extensions from that. And so it's kind of a base, you know, if you've got a base of something that you can extend and it's extensible, it, you know, it grows from list order fulfillment, and working with list to merge purge, if you will, and then marketing database that kind of stuff. Uh, actually, in the early days, the uh, second watershed event was acquiring the Citibank account. Okay. And uh, actually, the third major thing was, has anybody in here ever heard of Abilitech? Yeah. Huh? I don't remember what it was, but I remember here. Yeah, yeah. It, the third watershed was Abilitech, <clears throat> and uh, it is the reason Axiom still exists today. Yeah. I don't know if anybody... And, and so talk about your role in... Because I, 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 that was about the time I was yeah. joining Axiom, and I remember seeing, uh, actually it was the time that I moved down to Little Rock, and I remember seeing you on your video screen at Sharon's desk because you were home coding a military. Right, oh yeah, I did a lot of, yeah. A lot of coaching. Well, I, uh, the way I operated then, I'm still doing the same thing. This is embarrassing, you know, but <laughs> I'm still writing software. Uh, but it's just what I did in those days. I, I had a concept, and I... I say, I don't know exactly, I, I can see it, but I can't describe it, and I can't, I, I'm, it, it's not invented yet. It's a, it's a germ of an idea that needs inventing, but I, I, I really believe I can do it. And so talk, so talk about that a moment. So it didn't start as a Billitech, it started oh, as, yeah. and, and, and you pivoted a couple of yeah, times. Yeah, and we did, it exactly. It was, uh, you know, a, a national registry originally, and then it was a national advert, NAB, they call national, you know, I can't believe I remember that. NAB, National Address Space. And to get one address for every known address in the United States. And then we married those two concepts together uh, to become Abilitech and assign a number to every address 
and a number to every individual, and then the individual could move from one address number to another to a number. But what it allowed us to do is dedupe things and, and, and be able to do very large scale updates at a, at, a, at a very rapid pace, things that would be impossible to do that accurately without Abilitech. And Abilitech was truly a revolution in the direct marketing industry and it, it gave Axiom such a big advantage for these large scale databases. You, you agree with that? <laughs> Uh, it gave you such an advantage. I would say Glenn would agree with it, but he's like, yeah. But it, it, it allowed us to build very large marketing databases and be able to maintain those things accurately, which none of our competition was ever able to do. And, Including uh, implements. Yeah, well, and that was part of the thing. The big database is updated, managed. Without, without BillTech managing info base would be impossible. And you know, there are a lot of other watershed. The other watershed, of course, is the fact that we got into the data business. We became info-based. And by the way, our current business, I describe really as a data business. I, we said then, and I say now, in case you didn't know it's the data stupid, it is the data that drives every business and the success of every business. Data that can be turned into information and actionable things, where that actionable thing is driving a car, or driving a marketing program, or catching a scammer, which we're doing today. So why don't we use that as a transition over into uh, First Orion. Um, I, I read a little bit about the start of, of First Orion, and I'd heard uh, about that over the years with Griffin Networks, but talk yeah. talk about how you transitioned into that, that business. Well, uh, this guy named Keith Foda, who I came to hate, um, that's another story. <laughs> That's in the book, but it's really kind of interesting stuff how we got involved. In a very loving kind of way. Yeah, I love it. I hate the son of a bitch. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, uh, he was not a real honest kind of a person. And uh, the end of the story is his brother, we got in lawsuits with him, his brother offered to testify for us. <laughs> oh. <laughs> like to be at Thanksgiving after that. That <laughs> <laughs> was terribly. Parents moved to Florida, and they didn't even tell him they moved. <laughs> oh my! Oh, that was not a close-knit family, to say the least. So, but anyhow, uh, Keith was quite a salesman. He brought me this this concept of blocking phone calls and networks. Well, it sounded interesting. Something nobody was doing. I kind of like that. I could see that people are going to want to have more c c control over the the calls that come to them, and you know, I said, well, if we started by blocking phone calls, we could do other things. And, you know, I didn't know what all, but it's a cool idea. And he said, I got a, I've almost got a contract signed with Bell Canada, and they're ready to go as soon as I get uh, funding. And so I, you know, signed a contract uh, with him, uh, but I, I wanted to be sure I had somebody inside looking it out for what I was doing about that time, uh, Jeff Stallmaker. Uh, you know, retired, <laughs> quit Axiom. Uh, somebody else will go nameless. But anyhow, uh, Jeff had all he could take. And so uh, I, I told him, I heard, he had, I heard he had left, and he hadn't even, you know, his ink hadn't even dried on his resignation letter when I called him and said, hey, I got your next gig for it. He said, no, no, I don't want to do it. I'm going to take off three months. I said, no, you're not. And so he did, and you know, so anyhow, he's now, he's now he's in Seattle working for us, doing a fabulous job. But it, it, anyhow, uh, we, we, I invested the money in this thing, and it turned out, uh, you know, this is another lesson. Guys, don't do something you know nothing about. I knew nothing about telecom. We built marketing database for Sprint, I thought I was a telecom expert. Yeah, well, you know, one of the lessons always is invest in what you know. Well, my excuse was, hey, this is an IT kind of a problem. I understand computers and IT and software. This is my kind of problem. What I didn't realize at the time is the relationship between typical IT and a telecom network is, is kind of, you know, comparing race cars to bicycles. They both have wheels. 
that's about you know about it. And so that was uh, you know the, the whole original idea was ridiculous. And I mean literally I was uh, long story short I was really thinking about shutting it down. But Jeff and some of the guys said, hey. We think we could make this whole concept work on a BlackBerry, and that fascinated because I was already I'm a tech geek again, right? So the whole, you know, I, I, the whole idea of having a computer in your hand and what you could do with it, I said, boy, it'd be really cool if we could do this blocking in on an app, and. Then, same thing before, we could do a lot of other stuff, but our big value add would be the app. And my contention was that, just like, uh, you know, I had it, uh, Axiom is, eventually computing's free in, in the terms that we know it today. What it costs tomorrow is, you know, for example, we figured out that what we're doing at First Orion would cost at least $100 billion of computers if we bought them in 2000 to do what we're doing without a cloud computer. I mean, could never have done the business. You know, it would be a massive, that's the buy, that didn't count. We'd had to buy, you know, one of Axiom's, you know, buildings over there to put all the stuff in, it'd be crazy. So anyhow, I like the idea of uh, mobile technology and its potential and uh, so uh, I, what I uh, essentially, uh, uh, Keith had never met any of his milestones, and my investment was dependent on him hitting the milestones, and he'd made none of them. And uh, as a result of that, you know, the, instead of closing it down, basically, uh, you know, I took it over. And net, net is that uh, that was the beginning of a very long road. And, uh, you know, the long road is, is, you know, we talk about in the book, and I'm sure you're gonna ask me some other questions about it, but, you know, it was, it was kind of a rocky beginning, like a lot of startups are, guys, you know, you, you know that, but being an entrepreneur is really messy business. You think you're gonna do something, and you think you know people, and just like, you know, you, you don't know, uh, you know, uh, uh, a business partner until you're about to go broke and the guy you thought was your friend turns into an asshole or something, you know. Uh, you know, I watched, I watched the, the bus company here, you know, go through, go broke, really. And uh, while Charles Ward and some of them kept their sanity, they were doing insane things. I mean, you know, doing things that I knew were like, you know, you're you're actually you know actually doing things borderline illegal, and doing things which in the end actually reduce your cash flow, which is really stupid when you're running out of money. Mm -hmm. And they did it just to stay open another week. So, so talk uh, talk a moment, if you will. You, you left a, a, a very large company, multinational company, in in multiple countries, lots of structure, lots of um, yeah. employees. And you're now in an entrepreneurial endeavor. Well, I'm in Dallas when we start this day. Right. So I'm in Dallas. I'm like, how you doing? How, how's it going? Uh, you know. So talk about an absentee leadership, perhaps. Doesn't work very well. No. I, you know, as the company, you know, I had to keep putting more money in it. And, Cheap uh, check writer. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as I pause, I breathe hard, you know. <laughs> I did that on purpose. Yeah, I, I'll be honest with you. I've got about nine million in 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 this thing, and you know that's another lesson. I say, don't. You know, if you're starting and doing something hard with big ideas, you know you you, you got to be willing to you got to be willing to lose your investment. You have to be able to say, I've got to be able to go on if I lose it all. I, I'm not going to damage my family or my friends if I lose it all. I'm not going to ask a friend to invest something I know it's more than they can lose. And you know, and I I, I didn't uh, do that. I put up most of my own money, but went, you know, got a little money from other sources. But uh, you know, that was a really, you know, that was a tough time trying to run it from 
Dallas. Right. And as time went on, I, you know, they'd come to Dallas and we'd meet at planning meetings and I'd come up here once a month and then it became every other week. And then, you know, it was like, you know, things were, you know, it's like, you, the more committed you get, you know, the more checks you write, it's kind of like, how committed are you? Yeah. I was getting pretty committed. <laughs> <laughs> And finally, and this is a long story, and you know, you read it in the book, but finally I uh, was coming up as executive chairman and watching all these guys and suggesting, I was up here like every other week for two or three days, and that's horrible. You know, you're, you're, you're trying to... And that was here in Conway. When yeah, it was in Conway. Conway. You're coaching them and you're saying, hey, maybe we ought to do it this way. And they go, no, no, we're gonna do it this way. And you, you hesitate if you're, you know, if you're not really running it. Finally, I said, I'm taking over as CEO. And I just said, I got to. And I, I can't, you know, everybody's gonna hate me for coaching over the shoulder. And we were losing in that first quarter uh, of that year, we'd lost a half million dollars. And I said, how I'm like- How long ago was that, what year? This was uh, 2013, six 13. years ago. Okay. And this was in about April, and we were still losing money in the second quarter. Uh, not as much, because we'd already made some changes. But I said, I'm taking over, and there are gonna be a lot of changes, and we're gonna make money by December. And I mean, and then all of them will tell you now, they went, that, that old son bitch is crazy. <laughs> and, uh, but. Morgan? Yeah, <laughs> no, actually, what we actually made money in okay, December. Good. We actually made money in December, and uh, effectively every year since we we made money. Right. And uh, this last quarter, or the quarter we're in right now, uh, we'll make about a million dollars in this quarter. So, Fantastic. Very good. Yeah. So you have a hundred. And we're still investing heavily, heavily investing. One hundred and seventy employees. Not about that. Yeah, we just hired our first. Uh, employ in Dubai. Dubai. In Dubai. I would say Dubai like Arkansas. Dubai. Dubai. <laughs> in, in, a, in a nutshell, tell us what the core business is of First Orion now because it's, it's, it has pivoted. So it has pivoted. pivoted. Yeah, we were, you know, in the apps business because we couldn't get networks. But our dream always was to get in that network. And uh, with uh, IP based networks, it became plausible that we could do that. And so we concepted this thing and we had a great relationship with T-Mobile through Metro PCS. And uh, we got to know the T-Mobile guys and we went to them with a concept that we would uh, be able to block uh, scam calls in their network. And they looked at it as an advantage to be able to offer free scam protection to all their customers. Uh, and <clears throat> we, we had to make it as easy as possible for them so that it was not a huge engineering feat because they're not gonna, they're not gonna go revamp their network for this untried idea. And we came up with an easy way to make it work. Uh, we use the, the caller ID system as kind of a foundation. We're not getting into it, it's the, you know, the enum uh, database calls that, that go on inside the network already and you know we could we could do a little tricking up in those and actually uh, uh, cause a call to be uh, you know blocked and are you know tagged if they will say it with a scam likely tag and uh, they bought it and uh, it, it, and they realized the benefit of it, and, and we, we realized we were not fully integrated in the network, and to be fully integrated into the network so that we actually got in the call flow, we weren't waiting for somebody to ask us about a call, we got to actually see the whole call. This is beyond any scope of this meeting, but there's, when a call is initiated from uh, one party to another, the first thing that comes is a SIP you know, uh, uh, I call it invite message. And that invite message got a whole bunch of stuff in it. The number that's calling to, the number that's calling from, uh, 
uh, is that is that caller ID, which can be spoofed, by the way, uh, and it has a whole bunch of other fields describing, you know, that uh, that call, some generated by the network transport that has gone through, some in the in network that it's in, as well as some in the last network, and we wanted to be able to have the access to that whole thing, so that we could. Uh, detect spoof calls, which were beginning to be the thing, and uh, to be able to do other things. We came up with a, a concept of a delegator, which was really a general services platform running inside the network that could attach a lot of different services. It could attach caller ID services, it could attach stir shake, it could attach family solutions or business solutions. It sees every call and it can redirect it, it can send it to voicemail, it can send it to another party, and uh, it can add, and they add data to it or kill it like we're doing right now. Hence why you're in the data business. <coughs> we, are, our, our, we have a, a database of 700 million phone numbers and everything we've seen, and we see about uh, 250 million phone calls a day. And we had data on every one of those calls. And <coughs> we, we see the from number, and we see nine digits of the two number for uh, you know, privacy and security reason. We, we don't want to have all of the two numbers in there, because that, then that really gets to be problematic. But with, with this platform, we're able to actually stop scam calls. and. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll digress here, but uh, before the last two days, I had gone 14 days without a scam call with our technology. 14 days. I went 14 minutes today without one. Yeah. And uh, the reason I said the last two days, the, the scammers are always got their next scheme up right. their uh, sleeve. And... Uh, I don't know I've ever heard of, and I don't know if I'm describing this right, because I don't know what to call it, a denial of a service attack on T-Mobile's network. From It was initiated in the UK. They started bombarding the T-Mobile network with incredible numbers of calls, and they were all to the same phone number. So that means they got all routed through the same control point, and they were spitting hundreds of thousands of calls a minute into T-Mobile and they had figured out how to route them through Sprint. And so they were going to Sprint and Sprint, somehow or they tricked the Sprint network. They said they were T-Mobile numbers, but they weren't. And so it is, I mean, it's an elaborate, elaborate scheme. And that, uh, and, and and as you can imagine, what it did to you know our uh, our software, and it turned out our another vendor had a bug in their software, so you know they overloaded us, and the, and then you know when we didn't respond promptly, the you know the network just went into overload mode, started blocking every call. Is basically what it was doing. So. First Orion, I suspect, experiences some of the same problems that you experienced at Axiom with regard to talent. Let's talk a little bit about talent, and I know your involvement with the Arkansas Center for Data Sciences. Yeah. And uh, maybe tell us a little bit about that. And well, you know, the, the problem we always have in in a tech business, and and it's, it's, it's age old, is, you know, transitioning people into the tech jobs, which today are ever more complex, infinitely more complex than they were years ago because just because you can, you know, write in various language and understand something about servers and all this stuff, every company uses different data management, different security systems and different processes and procedures. There's no, there's no cookie cutter for this stuff. And to bring a new employee in is, is a nightmare for the current people. Hey, I, I, I'm overloaded, I need help. And you bring people in, they don't know anything. It's, it's uh, you know, it, it, it is actually an inhibitor to growing. Uh, but it's also an, an inhibitor 
to put a technology company in this state, it is a real problem, a huge problem. And the governor, thank goodness, has recognized it. And the college and universities, and you know, I, I joke, uh, and I said earlier, nicely back here that, uh, interestingly enough, we get some of our best graduates from UCA. And Go it's, it, it, it's yeah. really, you do that, right? Of course I did. Oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I think we had more UCA graduates than any other school. And it wasn't just because there were a lot of them. It was just because, you know, the school had always done a good job, just like with the Cody Academy and the other things. Schools are trying to be linked up, you know, to a great extent. But, you know, at Axiom, we had the same kind of problem. And we had to put Axiom University in, right? Yes, which you were in involved in, right? That's right. And so training and trying to come up with a system that will take people out of a two-year or four-year institution or somebody that's been in a job in a, another industry and get them, you know, trained. How does a new company coming into the state say, where can you find grad, you know, where can you find people that can help me? I've got all these specialized requirements. And they say, how many, how many trained people can you get? Three. Well, we need 150. Well, that ain't gonna work. Uh, but, uh, uh, there's a huge need for uh, better uh, uh, programs to be able to fill a gap between, you know, that is needed to fill a gap between whatever is available and what the company needs. And uh, we have used education programs, companies that have a lot like Axiom did, but we think there's a better way and it's with formal apprenticeship programs. and. You know, the Arkansas uh, Center for Computer Sciences, uh, or Data Sciences, is really computer and data, it's both, but we, you know, it's, that was too long a name. But uh, the uh, whole idea of that is to focus on areas where it could make a difference. And uh, there's a lot of federal money to support apprenticeship programs. There's a lot of experience. I heard somebody on TV talking about, you know, one of the president's initiatives is you know, getting apprenticeship programs, you know, and, and so it's kind of become a little bit bold. We started, a, a, we're in our third apprenticeship program at First Orion, and they have been, to say they've been a success is an absolute understatement. Uh, and so it is the Arkansas Center for Data Sciences is going to be promoting things like the apprenticeship program. Right. And it's going to do other things. It's going to try to work with the college university, like work with UCA on helping to get UCA involved apprenticeship programs to help UCA get more appropriate types of, of training and uh, educational experience in cooperation with businesses. And how, how do you provide those links? There's anybody doing that statewide right now. Yeah. We have the CIO of Walmart, and we have the CIO Tyson's, we have Warren Stevens, me, and the head of Arkansas Economic Development Commission, uh, Mike Preston. That is our really small board. I, you know, I'm kind of running this thing, I guess. But uh, I want a very small board so we can get stuff done. And uh, the governor is very supportive of it. Uh, he's, you know, he committed that he would put money in it and, and true to his word, I said, I need the money now, you're, you're late. And uh, I, I, I fussed at, the, at Mike Preston and the team over there and within hours we had $500,000. You know how hard it is to get money out of the state, I had $500,000 in three hours. Awesome, excellent. <laughs> like what? <laughs> but that's how important they think this is yeah. and, and, and they really know it is something that could make a difference. Our apprenticeship programs, our, our guys who were a little skeptical about it and some of our tech leaders saying, this is this is gonna allow us to be a $500 million company. This wow. this this kind of education. Very good. So matters of life and data, more of a memoir. Now what, more of a, a true business book. And I, I think you and I were talking a few moments ago, this is a business book, but kind of through the back door. It was. This is a front door business book. And you know, and that's it's interesting. A lot of people like you did recognize that. And when we were actually writing that book, and I, I collaborated heavily with uh, another guy that might sound like he's related, but he's not Jim Morgan. 
And, you know, the, the goal of the book was to teach business lessons through my life experience. That was, the, that was our stated goal. That's why there's a lot of that stuff in there. And this one is more a pure business book for entrepreneurs and business leaders to try to say, how do you, how do, you do the things that you need to do to be successful? What are the pitfalls you can have? And as I said, I've done a lot of the things that I said, man, I'll never do that before. But I want to leave it with one thing. You know, we, we had a potential investor in today who I think will probably invest in, in our business because we got so many growth opportunities right now, it's insane. Uh, and I said, you know, one of the things we're trying to do, because we've got some seeds of leadership, guys that were at Axiom and Libby is, you know, very well, Whitehurst and others, and Scott Hambeacon and Jay Calloway. Jay, are you back there? No, yes, he's not. <laughs> yeah. a, few, a, few year, a few years ago, Kim and I had lunch with Charles, or dinner, I believe it was, and I said, I, I kept thinking, I, I might get a call, and he said, well, we hire for talent. <laughs> <laughs> hey, surely I didn't say that. I can't believe, uh, can't believe I said that, but, you know, what, one of the things that I said is, you know, at Axiom, uh, we didn't think things like culture, uh, and you know, we just assumed leadership was leader. everybody's good guy's going to be a leader, and you know if they were either were or they weren't, and we didn't think structure was we didn't pay attention to structure, and we didn't pay attention to standardization, and we looked out and we were you know we were going on a couple hundred million in revenue, and we you know if we got ten times bigger we said this thing is unmanageable unmanageable and we had to backtrack and do some very painful things restructuring which you knew yep. right yep. it was hard. hard you know and so one of the things I was telling this investor today is I said those are the kind of lessons I'm not going to do wrong again I got Libby there to keep me honest and she'll do it and she's doing an incredible job Excellent. I want to play a little game here right quick right I'm going, to throw, I'm going to throw a word out to you and I want you to tell me the single greatest piece of advice associated with that word that you have, right? Just from all your experience. Oh, jeez. Here we go. I'm not good at tests. I always now get you're nervous. Right. <laughs> Leadership. It is the thing that makes more difference in a business than almost anything else. But it's not a leader. It is all the leaders in a business working in a unit and to common purpose. Great. Teamwork. Same thing, working to a common purpose. And it's it's like, if you have a group of people that are of mediocre talent, but uh, I always use the example of the Cabot football team with Malham, who some of you may know of. What well, he never had, he had the smallest guys, and you know, I hate to say it, he had a bunch of little white guys. And these guys were not all that talented, but they had purpose, they worked as an incredible team and they believe they could win. And when the team believes they can win, even if they are a mediocre talent, they can rise to great heights like Kevin did and win the state championship. Work culture. Well, it's just what we were talking about. It's like, what is, what is culture? It's how we work. And it is the absolute uh, crucial thing to have everybody understands. Everybody's got to be in the same, you got to be on the same culture path. Everybody's got to be on the same page on culture. Is, and you got to understand, you know, associate satisfaction surveys by leaders, we're going to start doing those again right now, oh. that you can imagine. And we've done Berkman, we've done the Berkman. Good. All of some of the stuff we learned, it worked. The stuff we did, we worked. But, uh, you know, the culture is, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of glue that holds it all together. And everybody's got to be on, got to understand what the culture is. Two words, hiring and firing. Well, I, you know, you know me, I've always been in, you know, the forefront of, I, I'm still, you know, I think one of our number one recruiters and hire, you hire the person that you know fits your organization, has got the talent and the ability to make a difference in your future. And if you find one extraordinary, you just hire them, whether they're in the budget or not. And that, and, and everybody at Axiom knows that, that I will do that. I've had two cases in the last 
few months, we had a, a young kid that we, we were all full on our intern program for the summer. Somebody said, we got this kid from Stanford who's unbelievable. I said, well, what are you asking me for? Hire him. Hire him. And you got to make the decisions uh, to hire the best that you could possibly get for every position. And that means at all levels. Whether quick, quick anecdote. You may not remember this, but you had been at a um, career fair or career day or something. No, you were, you had spoken to a class at the U of A, I believe it was. And you're driving back to Conway, and you called my office, and Cindy Childers was our uh, head of head of HR. You called my office and you said, Standridge, I need your help. And I went, okay. You go, I just hired somebody. And I was like, okay. And he goes, but I need you to find him a position before Cindy finds out. <laughs> Hey, hey, is Sarah here? Sarah, yeah. I, how did I hire you? Uh, right. <laughs> At a party. <laughs> All right. All right. And she one, works for Jay. One more word. The, fire, the firing, I want to say okay, this, is delaying firing uh, is the, the, one of the most common faults of good leaders because leaders always want to make people, good leaders want to make everybody successful. Sometimes you've got a round peg in a square hole. And, you know, when you keep transferring people, that's when you know that you made a mistake. And you should, you should, you know, you, I don't mean... Don't give people every chance, but there is some point in that chain where you know you went two chains yeah. to two lengths too far. Uh, last word: entrepreneurship. Well, there's a lot of it uh, rampant in in Arkansas, and there's a lot rampant in our U.S. culture. And I think that uh, we just need to give entrepreneurship more tools to be successful. Uh, that's everything from the things we're talking about training and you know all these things that have sprung up all over like you're doing and others uh entrepreneurs need help they need help and, and to uh test their plans and to tell them they're crazy and to tell them they're you know they're great and to help them make good decisions so they you know being an entrepreneur can be the greatest thing you ever did or can ruin your life and your family's life and i've seen all the above <coughs> And so, questions from the audience. Yes. yes. I was Daytona. I was reading on you, and I saw you do some race car stuff. And yeah, it seemed, I, like, it seemed like you deal with risk a lot, just not stuff. And, you know, you know I, 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 it's really interesting. I, I drove my last professional race in 2011. I probably shouldn't have driven that one, but. <laughs> uh, you know, I. I, I love car racing, and it, you'd be surprised it's not all what you think. I like the technology side, but I'm a mechanical engineer. I designed two race cars from scratch that were built and raced successfully. And uh, I like the engineering side of it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a great example, lesson teamwork. It's exciting. You know, people work all night and all day for a goal, and then suffer terrible defeat because, you know, somebody's engine blows up in front of you and you spin in the oil and hit the wall. You know, it's like, oh my God, all that for nothing, you know. But you have to learn how to accept success and failure. And it is one of the most humbling things you can do in the world is racing, car racing. Because, you know, I don't care how good you are uh, or how much money you have, you're going to have some terrible experiences, you know, as a driver. But on the risk side, I think this is very important. Uh, you know, I put seat belts in my cars when nobody knew what seat belts were. When I was in high school, I was putting seat belts in my car in the 1950s. I tell you that, that's how old I am. 1950s, I was putting seat belts in my car. And I don't know why, but I ended up upside down in two cars hanging from those seat belts and were not injured in either one of them. And I could have been hurt badly. And you didn't know why? Did you say I didn't know? I, it, well, I didn't. I didn't accept. I, it's man. It's risk. I knew I drove a little fast. I did a little crazy. And I said, I'm more likely to have a stupid wreck than people that don't. And uh, in in car racing, uh, you know, I 
uh, I was very careful about the kinds of I never would get in an Indy car, an open wheel car and race. I thought they were too dangerous. And I you know, was always very careful about the safety aspects of the cars that I drove in. And uh, you know, nobody was ever injured in, in one of my race cars, me or any of my co-drivers or anybody, so ever. I had the worst injury I had was in a, I was driving for somebody else, literally in a Ferrari, and I broke this bone when you know some idiot in a Porsche spun out and blew a tire, drove across the track in front of me, and I T-boned him, doing about a hundred. And uh, uh, another time when I a, a bolt broke uh, in the car I designed. So who was I going to blame in a steering component? Uh, so another question. So. Do you see phone numbers having a reputation in the future? So for example, when we go to Twilo to register a new phone number for an application we're working on, somehow I'll go and check and make sure that it doesn't have a bad rep yeah. on Google before I go and take that. Do you see that being a problem for people in the future if they pick up a new phone number and that one has a bad rep because of phone uh, Well, uh, what I think we're gonna be able to do is to uh, manage to you know, eventually stop the bad calls, and so I think it'll become less and less important in the years to come. We're working with Twilio, actually, some also, and some other people. To uh, we've got some products that'll help help with uh, uh, the the number reputation thing. But you know, if a phone number doesn't do scam calls because they don't go through, it'll help the yeah. <laughs> number reputation. So. We're to try to make it as unprofitable as possible for the bad guys to operate in in the telecom industry. One more, go ahead, Glenn. So, what's the real story behind the name Axiom? I've, I've heard, I was there for a long time. I've, I've heard a lot of. What's the real story? Well, you know, I want to, there's a little bit of a back interesting story. Uh, we had we hired Cranford Johnson. We we. Uh, we decided that our CCX network name was, you know, everybody wanted to know what it was, Conway Communications, telling everybody, Con, what the hell, you know. So we said, hey, we're, we're gonna be a big important company, and by that time I think we were, oh, hell, we must have been 70, 80 billion revenue to win. <laughs> and uh, we decided we needed a more big city name because we were dealing with all the banks then, and, we're also right then you know, really getting involved in international. We had our London subsidiary by that time. And so we said, that's kind of small town. And so uh, we went to Cranford Johnson and said, find us a name. And literally it took them weeks and weeks and weeks and they came back and they had 10 names. And they said, here are the 10 names we came up with. And I said, and, I, and the other team, I don't remember what everybody else said. I said, those are awful. <laughs> awful. And they were like, really, you don't like any of them? I said, I, I wouldn't, no, no. And you know, it was kind of like, maybe forget it, you know, just forget it. Uh, but they said, give us another chance. And so they were gone for about a week and said, can we come up? We need to talk to you. So, I mean, just not me. I don't know who else it would be. But they came up and they said, we have one name and we know you're going to love it. And they flipped out Axiom. I said, sold. You know, uh, because, it, it, you know, CCX Network, ACX, tied a little bit of linkage to the past, uh, but axiom is a truth. Uh, and so it kind of like, oh, that's who we are. We're the truth. We're the good guys, you know. We're, and that's part of the reputational thing we tried to do was build. Something we didn't talk about is reputation. Yeah. And, and that's one of the reasons we were all successful at axiom is the banks literally trusted us. Right now at T-Mobile, the problem they're having with the guys from Sprint and you know the the UK denials, we're part of their team. I mean, we're just like working here with them, and that's what you have to have. They got to trust you. They really trust you. So we're trying to build that 
you know, that aura of trust and we're the honest guys. We're, you know, we're going to tell you the truth. So I love the, the Axiom name. I thought it was just really cool. I'm going to leave with one, one final question. What's one piece of business advice? You, you've given several, but uh, one, one of the best pieces of business advice that you would leave us with. I can't you don't F up, can I? <laughs> <laughs> you could, you could, because you've given me that advice several times. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm going to tell you, that's, I, I've given that advice about a million times. But, I got it from Madrid, Spain one time. Oh, God. Uh, I, you, know, you know, being uh, successful in any kind of business endeavor is being, you know, rational, being passionate, but be rational. Uh, don't get out over your skis, and, and, and you know, there's no need to take crazy risk. I'm a risk taker, but I'm a calculated risk taker. And you know, you say flying airplanes, I do fly airplanes. The safest thing you can do today is fly an airplane if you're good at it. And I always thought I was as good as any of our professional pilots. I'm not sure what they thought, but I did. And uh, uh, I was pretty good at it. And so, you know, you got to take calculated risks. You've got to be realistic about your chances and you've got to listen to other people. Now, a lot of times down in your heart, you know, and I was telling a story today, if you were absolutely, and this is the pitfall we all have, down your, just in your gut, you know, this is the right way to do this. This is the way to do it. We've got to do this. And Abilitech was one of those things. I literally had the leadership team, I hate to say it at Axiom, where pretty much against, not the idea, they love the idea, but they were against the scale of the investment. They said, we, it's going to be too disruptive for our accounts, it's going to cost us too much in equipment, programming time, and manpower. And, you know, and I said, guys, this is one of those things that's a gating condition for me. You know, if you are not with me on this, I want to tell you, I don't do this lightly, I said, I am fucking out of here. And I said, we, this is something we've got to do. I believe in it so strongly. And I did that occasionally, not very often. I didn't, I used the F word a lot. Oh, did I use it again? My, Libby tells me, she said, I'm gonna slap you every time you do that. <laughs> she called me and told me to do that, so. <laughs> she probably did. But, you know, there's sometimes you feel so strongly about something. And, you know, I, I just knew I could see what this could do to transform our business. I just knew it. I could just like, I knew it in my soul and I wasn't going to, you know, if the team just couldn't buy into it, and it wasn't that all of them were against it. It was like, but the, you know, like there was just generally Roger, you can imagine, didn't want to spend the money and, you know, Jim was for it. Jim likes, you know, because he was actually involved in it. But there were a lot of them that were like, you know, hey, you know, I don't think we ought to. I just said, look, guys, it, it's that important to me. I, just, I don't think you understand it, at least the way I see it. It's going to transform our business. Right. And so we did it. And they all later said, thank God you did that. So. Now what? The biography of a finally successful startup. We have copies from Wordsworth that are there in the back. Oh, yeah, I'm going to sign books, they like told me. I was gonna, I'd like love to. Buy a copy. Charles will sign it for you. I, 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 you know, we had a big uh, signing event in North Little Rock with a thousand people, and you know, I feel really guilty now. I, I told Wordsworth they probably ought to order a hundred or so books. I don't know how many she ordered. Bless her heart. And we had it was the night of a huge rainstorm and all, a lot of complications, and so she couldn't do the signing event. So, you all have got to buy all hundred copies. <laughs> you can start right there. There you go. Thank you all so much for uh, coming tonight. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.